Hi everyone, my name is Vinayak Powell. I'm a comedian in Los Angeles and uh, I've opened for Russell Peters. I've uh, toured India, I actually became the youngest guy to do so. I've performed at the Calcutta Comedy Festival. And uh, I love doing comedy and I hope you enjoy my videos and my sets. It's all for you and to make you laugh. Enjoy. What's up, San Jose? How are you guys doing? Yeah. Please give up your host, the comedy just saw that did a good job. Yeah. So yeah, I'm in LA, and I, let me say, I'm from the Bay Area originally. I miss you guys so much. I do. I, I seriously do, because uh, being a Niner fan in LA, it's hard. It, it's really hard. Let, let me tell you, I miss the Oakland Raider fans in the Bay Area, because the LA Raider fans are a gang. They're literally a gang. Let me tell you, it, it, it's this bad. I had a comedian from Chicago fly in to do one of my shows, and he bought a Raider cap. I'm like, why'd you do that? He's like, oh, it's just for protection. <laughs> yeah. I was raised in the South Bay area, and uh, I was raised by a single Indian mom, and what that means is, I go to her with all my problems, and she just make things worse. <laughs> and I'd be like, Mom, all my friends are calling me fat. No, you're not fat. <laughs> You just have a big appetite. <laughs> or Ma, all my friends are calling me dumb. No, you're not dumb. You just want to be a comedian. <laughs> or Ma, all my friends are calling me ugly. No, you're not ugly. You just look like your father. <laughs> and the way she raised me, I was super Hindu as a kid. Like she told me, you know, the whole thing with Hindus is we can't eat beef because cows are a sacred animal. At five years old, she told me, "Can I? If you eat beef, you're going to die." I believed her, and I was like seven years old in the cafeteria and they have something called a hamburger, and to me, ham is pork, so I'm like, oh, this is all good. <laughs> oh, no. I saw my Muslim friend eating the same thing, like, what are you doing? He was like, oh, this is beef, I'm, I'm crying. I'm crying, because I think I'm going to hell. And I, <laughs> I go to the principal, he's like, why are you crying? I'm like, I ate beef. I am going to die. So he calls my mother up. And she's like, what is going on? And I'm like, Ma, I ate beef, why am I not in hell yet? And she's like, oh, I was just kidding. <laughs> that was my first Santa Claus is not real moment. <laughs> you, know, you know, it's interesting. Um, when I left the Bay Area, everyone thought I was a Mexican. And, yeah, the only reason I took Spanish in high school was to tell Mexicans I'm not fucking Mexican. <laughs> You know how hard it is to tell other brown people you're not their type of brown? <laughs> Look, I'm at a Philly cheesesteak restaurant run by Mexicans. I'm like, holy shit, these people can cook everything, you know? People ask me, Benai, can you cook Indian food? I'm like, no, ask Jose, he can do it better than me. <laughs> so at the Philly cheesesteak place, right, um, I'm ordering and the guy's like, hola, como estas? I'm like, dude, I'm an Indian. He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm an Indian. He's like, no. Yes, dude, I'm in India. It's like, fine, you can be Indian today, but we're gonna convert you. <laughs> what the fuck does that mean? <laughs> He's like, oh, you're just gonna marry my sister. I'm like, what? <laughs> you're gonna give me your sister just like that. He's like, oh, don't worry, I got 10 more. <laughs> <laughs> now, it's interesting growing up, because when you're an Indian, you either gotta be an engineer, a doctor, or you're adopted. <laughs> and I'm a stand-up comic, so my mom just calls me a Pakistani. <laughs> No, I, was, I, I moved to Boston for my freshman year of college, and, and my best friend in Boston was a Pakistani Muslim named Danny. Now, you guys should know your history. He just killed me a long time ago. You know, but he didn't, and we screwed with people at our college about our cultural history. Uh, and he introduced me to his friend Joe, and Joe was like, oh my god, you know Danny? He's such a great guy. I'm like, Danny's a great guy? You know, he killed half my people. <laughs> and Danny looks at me and says, I should have killed the other half. <laughs> I got him back, he's a Muslim, he has to pray at Mecca five times a day. I was like, Danny, what direction do you pray towards? He points towards the north. 
Mecca is in the southeast. And he's like, no. He takes out his Mecca locator app on his phone. <laughs> he's like, oh my God, you're right. Now, an Indian Hindu telling a Pakistani Muslim where Mecca is, like Canadians like a Mexican how to make a taco and being right about it. <laughs> and I took it one step further. I was like, Danny, this is probably why you can't get with women. You can't find their holy Mecca. <laughs> It's so funny being a Hindu in the United States because nobody knows anything about my religion, so I make shit up and people believe it. <laughs> and when I have to explain Hinduism, I always tell Americans, we created yoga. So for all the men in the room, we created yoga pants. <laughs> Lululemon, that is me, okay? <laughs> yes. <laughs> I love that. There you go, you're my man. <laughs> You really stare at yoga pants, huh? <laughs> oh, that, that's not good to say. <laughs> man, uh, man, it's interesting. Uh, Hinduism was the first religion ever created. In our scriptures, it says to respect all other religions. I do it for a different reason. You see, other religions, one God. Hindus, 180 million of them. So what that means is a Jew screws up one slap to the face. Hindu screws up 180 million slaps. <laughs> and the worst part is all our gods have 10 hands. <laughs> You know, white people, you guys confused me growing up. You did. Like, when I started interacting with y'all more as a kid, you guys would say a phrase, holy cow. I was like, oh, it's holy for you guys, too? <laughs> Man, Hindus and Muslims have been fighting for so goddamn long, and I'm sick and tired of it. You guys want to know why? You want to know why I think we're fighting so much? It, I think... Muslims hate how Hinduism spread as a religion. Because Islam spread through war, pillage, and force. Hinduism spread through yoga, meditation, and fucking. <laughs> so when the first Muslim came into India, it was like, oh my god, these guys do it so differently. <laughs> and they made the first book about sex. And this book teaches them how to find the clitoris. Wow. We probably should have read this before we decided to cut that shit off. <laughs> oh, don't give me that. That's, I'm being pro-clitoris, okay? That is the most feminist Muslim joke you're ever gonna hear. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> and when I was growing up, um, you know, I, I, like, this is how it goes with Indian kids. You either gotta be an engineer, a doctor, or you're adopted, you know? <laughs> and I'm a comedian, so my mom just calls me a Pakistani. <laughs> and, um, you know, the whole doctor thing is so real. Oh my God. Like, when I started out, my mom was like, why are you doing this comedy thing? And I was like, Ma, I get to travel, you know, I get to do stand-up, it's fun. She says, oh, you get to travel. She takes out a brochure for Doctors Without Borders. <laughs> you know, and then when I toured India, I became the youngest guy to ever tour that country. You know, and then she was like, okay, fine, this comedy thing is okay. But until you become famous, become a doctor. <laughs> and when you do get famous, don't forget about me. I want a date with Harrison Ford. <laughs> <laughs> and the worst thing, growing up, like when you had those career options, you have to have good grades. You do. You get bad grades in an Indian household and you're done. You know, I had one B on my report card. One B, everything else was an A. And my mom was like, you're not my son anymore. <laughs> the only reason she took me back is because I'm a tax exemption and tax returns. <laughs> and the screwed up part was she didn't mark me down as her kid. I was a disability. <laughs> You guys know about the religion Sikhism? Yeah. And it's a pretty, it's a pretty short religion, you know. And it, with Sikhs, they're some of the nicest people, and the traditions are amazing. Yeah, damn straight. You guys Sikhs? That's what's up. I, I'm gonna do a joke about you guys right now. All right. That's what's up. So in Sikhism, there's a tradition men have to follow. It's called the five Ks. Okay. And in the tradition, Sikh men they have to comb their hair, they have to wear a turban, they get a bangle, they also get a knife, which makes them Raiders fans. <laughs> And then they get holy underwear. They have holy underwear, which I think is freaking amazing. Because that's the best way to get kids potty trained, okay? 
Like imagine a sick mom coming up to you and saying, hey, don't crap in your pants or God is going to get you. <laughs> yeah. If I was a sick kid, I'd go up to my mom and be like, look, mom, I made a holy shit. <laughs> and, Like, it really impacted me growing up. You know, I went to Oregon for high school full of white people. Yeah, that's what's up. <laughs> They're all from my high school. <laughs> but, but now, now, the thing is, white people eat beef like it's nobody's business. I didn't realize it. It was a culture shock for me, okay? We go on this all-school camping trip. The only food they're serving, chicken and steak. I've never seen a steak in my life, okay? And my mom took out cable because of the steak commercials. <laughs> That's not a lie, okay? And um, they run out of chicken, so I take this thing, all right, put it on my plate, my friend's like, dude, that's beef. I'm like, oh shit, I'm eating Jesus. <laughs> yeah, and then I look at the cook, he's cooking all these cows, I'm like, man, this guy's Satan, you know? And they take a bite of the steak. I go over to the cook, I'm like, man, this is so good. You're my new God. <laughs> yeah. Now when my mom asks me, yo, uh, where are you going? I always tell her I'm going to pray, which really means I'm going to BJ's Steakhouse. <laughs> and people always ask, so Vin, you're a Hindu, why do you eat beef? I always tell them before I tried it, I didn't realize holiness tasted so good. <laughs> Have you ever noticed when a person acts above their pay grade? Have you ever seen that? Like, I saw a parking enforcement officer trying to arrest somebody. <laughs> that doesn't work, you know? Like, you know? That's like if Wendy the Pooh tried to be the Chicago Bears mascot. <laughs> okay, there's not many sports people here. <laughs> no more sports jokes for you guys. Man, there's this one homeless guy that was trying to give me real estate investment advice. <laughs> I'm not lying to you. Do you know what he told me? He straight up said, don't live wherever you invest. That's what he said. Don't live wherever you invest. I was asking him, what did you invest? And he was like, oh, I did that whole adopt a highway thing. <laughs> but my, my, my previous relationship was interesting. I was dating my ex for two and a half years, and at the end of it, it wasn't going so well. Like, she wasn't supportive, she wasn't nice. Like, she literally told me, I don't support you being a stand-up comedian. I was like, oh, I don't support you being a bitch. <laughs> you know? And I'm not gonna say I was the best boyfriend. I'm not gonna say that. But I did make her feel special a lot of time. Like, literally, I took a Greyhound from Boston to Toronto just to see her. It's a 16-hour bus ride. That changes a man. <laughs> I was hanging out with the Amish on the bus, okay? And I loved it because they made me feel like I had a good fashion sense. <sighs> there was this one time she takes me to a mall, my ex, right? And she's like, Vin, you're 90% of what I want in a man. I was like, oh, that's a really nice compliment. 90%, I'm an A, okay? That's pretty good. And then she's like, oh yeah, I'm breaking up with you. I'm like, what? You broke up with me with a reason that sounds like a compliment. That's like if I went to a lady and I was like, yeah, you're the woman of my dreams, but only in my dreams, because in reality, you suck. <laughs> I feel like if my ex heard that bitch, she'd be like, that's not the full truth. I'm like, yeah, no, it's only 90% of it. <laughs> and we dated for a while, and, and like when, when I tell this story, people are like, Vin, why'd you date her for so long if it wasn't going so well? And I tell them, you know, she was white, and uh, I kind of like the taste of privilege. <laughs> it's so funny being a comedian, like as an Indian guy, because you know, if you're Indian, you're either an engineer, a doctor, you're adopted, you know? <laughs> and because I'm a comedian, my mom just calls me a Pakistani. <laughs> Oh, this is gonna get so much fun. <laughs> I love liberal crowds because when, the moment you mention race, like, oh my God, oh, that's so bad. I'm like, are you guys serious, racist? So I feel like liberals are allergic to minorities, you know? 
just because of my jokes. Like, I, I say one brown joke, and people are like, that's so scary. <laughs> really. Like, I, I, you, guys want, you, you guys want to hear a true story? You really want? So I'm doing a show in the Deep South, and one guy's like, hey, you're a funny sand nigger. And I'm like, oh, wow. Thank you. You're my favorite person in the crowd, because you're the only one who called me funny. <laughs> That got the liberal slap. I'm so happy about that. <laughs>
And this Indian auntie comes up to me and she's like, I hope someone marries you. You're very dark, no? She just kept rambling without even realizing the ramifications of what she was saying. It then hit me. Even if Instagram and Indian aunties are alike, there is one big difference. Unlike Insta, aunties have no filters. So I'm at this kid's birthday party, I'm sitting and eating, and this little boy from India comes and looks at my plate and he's really surprised. He's like, oh my God, even in Australia, people eat pakoras? And I said, of course people eat pakoras in Australia. But this is chicken nuggets. Thank you, everyone. I hope you enjoyed my set. Please stay safe and keep well. Oh, okay. Hi, guys. I'm Namisha Jane, and I hope you've been enjoying the show so far. My favorite thing on Curry Traits is when somebody drops a Bollywood meme. I had no idea that so many of you were so nerdy about Bollywood. <laughs> Hello, I'm Nimisha and I've lived here now for two months at my parents. <laughs> that is an accurate statement, but it's not satisfying to a cab driver. How long have you really been here? I've been in this cab like three seconds. No, how long really? Where are you from? Where are you originally from? Where are your parents from? I know the answer, just say it. At this point, I check the time. Cause if it's a long ride, I'm not just gonna say anything. Well, where is anyone really from? I mean, we're all children of God and God is from another dimension. <sighs> And where I'm from from, lots of gods. Yeah, where are you from from? Well, where I'm from from, spiritually, 1960s. Uh, are you on the left or is here okay? Here's fine. Uh, and I'm from India. Yes! Uh, every time. But uh, real talk. <laughs> Something I think about a lot these days is uh, sustainability. And now we're talking about sustainable fashion. Buy used, save the planet. So what's happening is that people are going crazy for vintage Levi's. Thrift store is now fancy. And broke people, they just go to the store store because 50% off every day. When they're done, they send their Levi's to thrift. And when those people outgrow their Levi's, they can buy more and so on and so forth. This isn't sustainability. You have to really zoom out of the Levi's paradigm to see why. See, Levi's are inherently unsustainable because they're not designed around our diet. We actually redesigned our diet to fit the Levi's and called it the Special K Challenge. Two bowls a day slip into your Levi's. If there was no Levi's, there would be no Special K. At best, it would be okay. This is where it's interesting to compare cultures. See, in India, they approach this differently. They first looked at the diet and they asked that question, what do we eat? And the answer they found was, a lot. <laughs> we eat all fucking day in India. We eat like hobbits, like first breakfast, second breakfast, luncheon, first chai, second chai, third chai, chai. You know how grab coffee means talk business and free internet? Chai means less gossip and test the limits of deep frying. So for women, what they wear is a long piece of fabric called a sari, cause it's one size fits all. As you grow, it grows. Your sari doesn't give a fuck about your size. It will find a way to wrap itself around you and leave extra for you to wipe your face and swatch your children. For the top, it's a crop top, because they knew you can't contain the stomach. For men, you guys seen the pants on dudes' Indian clothes? Open them up, they go out to here. Yeah. And the name is like 
pajamas, uh, spelled pajamas, but uh, it's pronounced pajamas to let you know. You can eat as much pie as you want. Always fit these jamas. Hi, my name is Joel Murugaya, aka Jeb Amani. My act is a stand-up comedy performance which focuses on being brown and being fat, both of which I am. I really love curry traits because it's such a relatable platform for all of us brown people to come together and share similar life stories and experiences. Hello, ladies and gentlemen of the Webtonet. I am Jeba Mani and it's a good thing it's sunny outside because even though I'm wearing black, it still means it doesn't look like your screen has suddenly gone dark. Now that's good because it doubles up as a brown joke and a fat joke. Now I could have worn a white shirt to do this routine, but I usually save my white shirts for when I'm trying to date women. Here's, here's my dating pitch to women, okay? I go up to a girl and I'll say, hey, if we get married in a few years, you can use my white shirt as a wedding dress. I mean, think about it. Good fabric for saris doesn't come cheap. And besides, you would look so much better in it than I would. When I wear a white shirt, I look like I look like a walrus try to crawl try to crawl out the top of an igloo, you know, just like ah ah ah. Now, for the record, I researched that bit by going on YouTube and looking up a video called Walrus Sounds. So whatever this routine lacks in humor, it makes up for in education. Trust me. If you liked this episode of this nature documentary, tune in for more episodes of Obscure Animal Noises with me, your host, Sir David Fattenborough. Now, I have a love-hate relationship with sports. Like, I love following a lot of sports, but uh, because of my uh, excessive work here, I'm not good at really playing any of them. And that's also because I'm brown as well, because brown people generally don't play the kind of sports that most people care about. To me, cricket and hockey, which brown people really like, aren't sports. I think brown people really enjoy cricket and hockey because I see them as child punishment exercises. Teach a man to fish and he'll eat for a lifetime. Teach an angry brown parent how to hold a cricket bat or a stick and they will turn them into weapons of ass destruction. It's really, really scary. So when I was a kid, right, uh, I would always, whenever I got in trouble with my mom, I'd always be able to outrun her. It was like the cheetah and the gazelle. I'd always just knew that I just had to wear her out. I didn't have to try so hard. I just had to wear the old lady out. But a little did I realize that my mom is a different kind of cheetah. So all of a sudden, when I was misbehaving, the pursuits just suddenly stopped. And instead, I was beginning to get fed. She would offer me food. And I thought to myself, hmm, crime doesn't just pay, it feeds, and it feeds well. And suddenly, the chasing started again. And before, when I was running as fast as a gazelle, now I could only run as fast as a wounded gazelle. And it was one of those seconds before disaster moments, you know, where right before the cheetah catches its prey, I suddenly figured out that she had leveled the playing field where she realized that if she couldn't get any faster... She just had to make me slower. And what she did was limit my athletic prospects because all I could just basically play at this point was darts. You guys ever seen darts players? Like, all of them have guts that have either come from beer, burgers, or both. I was watching the finals of the World Darts Championship and this guy had a gut and everything, was wearing a purple shirt to match his purple mohawk. The dude looked like the love child of Guy Fieri and the purple Teletubby. It was crazy. So I feel like darts, darts is my thing. Track and field, not so much. Back in school, there used to be these track meets and you'd always have to qualify to make the finals of these track meets. And I never understood why the teachers would always make the fat kid try to uh, qualify for the finals because fat kids suddenly don't turn up at starting lines and turn into Usain Bolt. It just never happens. But after a while, I tried to figure it out. I figured maybe with 
the sprints, they thought, better he get heartache from trying to run than trying to attract girls and get rejected. With the shot put, I figured they thought, let him work the muscles in his arm instead of his wrist. But I could never for the life of me figure out why they tried to make me do the high jump. Because here's the thing. You know that I can't make the high jump. I know I can't make the high jump. But the teachers didn't seem to know that. So I thought it was time for the student to become the master. So one day I thought, I'm going to end this Paul's whole career. And I just ran straight at it and jumped over, more like breach, like a whale, and just destroyed the thing like I was playing Fruit Ninja. I can tell you that was the best physics experiment I've ever done in my life. That's it from me, ladies and gentlemen. I'm Jebba Mani. Thank you very much. Stay well, stay safe, stay sane.